Okay, so I'd like to introduce uh, Elisabetta Matsumoto, or Sabetta as she ca calls herself. So, uh, Sabetta is an assistant professor in the, at, in the Department of Physics at Georgia Tech. Um, her group focuses on the geometry and topology of soft materials and the effects of elasticity on emergent structural and mechanical properties of uh, complex systems. So that's one side of her scientific life, and the other side is working in mathematical art, where she's made a big splash, and she's already talked about some of her textile design to the teacher group. Otherwise, she works on virtual reality, 3D printing, jewelry designs, and various other types of textile designs. So today, her talk, um, so as you saw, there are a few technical issues, so it's not quite the talk that she was hoping to give, but it'll be great nonetheless. So please uh, welcome Sabeda Matsumoto. All right, thank you. Can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. Awesome, thanks. Okay, so um, I guess you saw that there were a bunch of technical difficulties. Um, so basically, I have the highest end virtual reality system on the market, which means that their software has not kept up with their hardware, and I'm getting a problem where my computer is running right, but um, it it's the cord is incapable of sending enough data to the headset for it to run properly. So it's kind of broken and kind of working, so the computer's fine, the headset in there is broken. So normally what I do when I give this talk is I have a ton of volunteers come up from the audience and I explain how you guys sort of use your bodies to navigate around in hyperbolic space. But since uh, there's nothing to see in the headset, I'm gonna have Henry do it blind. So um, the headset is still detecting his position and all of the phenomena you will be able to see by looking at the screen. Um, he, however, might bash into a uh, chalkboard or fall off the stage. Um, hopefully that won't happen, but... Um, but uh, yeah, just, just be prepared. Um, and the downside of that is that I also usually leave this up for everyone to come play with for a while afterwards. And unfortunately, that means that, um, that it's not going to work right now. Um, I will play around with it when we get like after this and see if I can download a new version of the beta. So this only works with the beta version of the software, which is kind of silly because this has been on the market since like last December or something like that, and they still haven't gotten their act together. Um, so uh, bear with me for that. Um, so I guess I'm gonna be talking to you um, a bit about hyperbolic space today. Um, so I guess show of hands, how many of you are familiar with hyperbolic space? Okay, so I'm going to be, this is kind of a more public lecture to get people who are not super familiar with it on board. So I'm gonna talk a bit about um, a bit about hyperbolic space first, and then we're going to switch to the um, VR setup so that we can kind of show consequences of um, what happens when you move and walk around in a curved space. Um, and I guess I should get going because we're starting a little bit late. Hmm. Okay, so, hmm, is this not working? Okay. <laughs> ah, there we are. Okay, so, huh. Okay, this is not working. So, okay. Um, can you grab me? Um, okay, so I'm gonna start by telling you a bit about curvature, and I'm gonna start from the point of view of thinking about clothing. So how many of you have ever like made some article of clothing, sewed anything, fixed anything, put a button on a shirt? Okay. Okay, so I, I got a big show of hands for button and <laughs> some people uh, around um, who, who've maybe made some clothes or maybe, um, maybe fix something. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna start by um, talking a bit about how you make a shirt. So um, the thing about clothing that's hard is that every human body is curved. Like I don't care how skinny you are, or how bony you are, or whatever, you still have curves. Um, and fabric is flat. Uh, fabric is, if you're not dealing with a, like a knitted fabric, it is not stretchy. Um, and you have to go from these 
flat sheets to something that you can wrap around a curved body. And so we do this using seams. Um, so starting with, um, starting with this, this is um, a dress shirt, which uh, I guess being at a math conference in hot Park City, probably not very many people in the audience are wearing this kind of shirt, um, but probably most of us have something that looks at least equivalent in our closet somewhere. Um, so if we wanted to make this, I mean, you could imagine cutting out, you know, two pieces like this and sewing them together. But it turns out that the actual pattern for making um, a dress shirt looks like this. So um, each of these, there's something like 57 different pieces of fabric and 78 seams that go into just a simple dress shirt. Um, and you'll notice, if you look really closely, there are almost no straight lines in this entire pattern, except for the places where um, it says fold. And that's just because we've got bilateral symmetry, there's no point in cutting a left side and cutting a right side um, that are mirror images of one another. You just fold and cut one side. Um, and so the reason that this has all sorts of interesting curves um, and different shapes in the seams is to accommodate the curvature of the human body. And not only curvature, like you could imagine having like a shirt where you can't do anything but stand like this, but you do need to be able to move around. You need to be able to articulate your shoulders, bend your elbows, things like that. So all of these seams are designed to accommodate that part of the body. Um, so this is sort of breaking it down into the, the couple of fundamentals of things that people in sewing do. So if you'd like to have positive curvature, um, you make a dart. So a dart, basically, you take um, a sheet of fabric, you fold it in half, and so a little diagonal seam through the fold. Um, and then when you unfold it, you get a cone. So this is, um, so this would be uh, a singular point of positive curvature. Um, and these are used at um, places like uh, busts and waists. So this is basically taking a plane and trying to remove some area from it to give it some curvature. Um, on the other side, you can imagine adding curvature by taking a wedge and inserting it into, um, into the fabric. So um, I guess I have something of a tulip skirt on, so that's sort of the type of thing that would have extra area around the hem of the skirt rather than at the waist of the skirt. Um, and so this is um, a point here where you have um, a singular point of negative Gaussian curvature. So here I've taken a plane and I've added some area to it. So this is how, um, in sewing, I can accommodate for negative Gaussian curvature. Um, so here's some nice fabric that has hexagonal symmetry. So what I can do is I can cut out a sixth of it um, and sew it together into a cone. Um, and you'll notice that not only do I have um, a conical shape, I've got a bit of positive curvature, but because I removed exactly one sixth of it, I have um, a point here that has five fold rotational symmetry. Um, so this is perfectly five fold rotational symmetry here. Um, if I take this wedge now and instead um, add it into um, another piece of fabric, I end up with um, a point of uh, sevenfold symmetry, except the fabric doesn't lay in a way that is um, that that has this symmetry unless you perfectly arrange it so that it does. Um, so this is how um, one might start building something like a hyperbolic plane. So you've got points that have negative curvature, and you want to have this negative curvature everywhere. So my friends, um, Andrea Shui, who is a clothing designer, and Robin Selinger, who is a theoretical physicist, um, decided that they would take this idea. Um, I gave a sort of similar talk at. Um, uh, 
in Santa Barbara, I don't know, three or four years ago, and they decided they would turn this into a dress. So they wanted to come up with a way of um, making a dress that would sort of fit any woman's body, providing you had sort of a parameterization for it. Um, and not just skinny women or not, you know, just sort of like the clothing model type women, but any, any woman with any shape. Um, and the idea they had was that they would take regular pentagons, hexagons, and heptagons and sew them together in a patchwork so that um, the pentagons are places where you have positive curvature and the heptagons are places you have negative curvature. Um, and they turn this into the bodice of a dress. Um, speaking of dresses, uh, this is a beautiful couture French wedding dress. And these are some human intestines. <laughs> uh, so what do you guys think these have in common? Folds? Anything else? Big surface? Uh, no to cylinders, but yes to everything else. Um, so OK, so these, these do have a lot of folds and ruffles. Um, and both of them, it turns out, have, have negative curvature. And not only do they have negative curvature, but the mechanism by which, the physical mechanism by which they have negative curvature is the same in both situations. So for, let's take the dress to start with. So in this case, um, Imagine you've got a piece of tulle, which is the sort of stretchy mesh stuff in the skirt, and you want to sew it to what's called boning, which is just sort of like a stiff, um, a stiff layer. So the stiff layer you can't extend, but the, but the tulle is pretty stretchy. So you stretch the tulle as far as it possibly goes, and you sew it to um, the boning, and then you let it relax. And when it relaxes, you end up with this roughly periodic structure down here. So for human intestines, so it turns out many biologists have said that um, gastrulation is the most important step of life. And gastrulation is the point at which you go from um, a, a three ball to a solid torus. So this is uh, at, when you're an embryo. Uh, so you're basically getting a digestive tract. So you need a way of separating inside and outside. You need a way of digesting food. So this is the topological change that allows you to become an animal. Basically, you can ingest and excrete food. Um, and so when once you've undergone gastrulation, you have um, a neural tube that starts to form, and that's what's going to become your uh, spinal cord and, um, and sort of nervous system precursor. And there's, um, there's a membrane that goes between your, uh, your uh, gut tube, which is going to become your intestines, and your neural tube. And what happens as you grow is that your gut tube is stiffer, and it also grows a lot faster than the membrane connecting it to um, your neural tube. And so what happens is that um, exactly this is going on. So your gut tube acts like the boning. It grows faster, and it's stiffer. and um, the membrane that connects it to the neural tube acts um, as the tool, which is um, flexible, and you end up having an elastic instability, which gives you this sort of periodic ruffling pattern. And that's why um, this person's intestines and my intestines and your intestines all basically have the same type of ruffles. It's not as if someone took you know, an 18-foot long tube and just started shoving it randomly into our stomachs. We actually have um, sort of a physical reason why um, our insides look the way they do. So we see um, these sorts of ideas of curvature all throughout um, nature. I think I better hurry up. Um, so we see this at the microscopic level. This is inside uh, the retina of a tree shrew. This is um, the gyroid minimal surface. Um, this is something that is used um, as a UV filter. Um, you see it in soap films. Uh, so this is, again, a gyroid, but done at the centimeter scale. Um, and then there's a question as to, uh, is the universe curved or not curved? It seems like it's flat. But um, we only have data that goes out as far as the visible universe. So we're not completely sure yet. 
Um, we also see this in nature. So here, a nudibranch is using the fact that it has negative curves, uh, negative, negatively curved uh, mantle to swim. So it's sending traveling waves down its sides, and that propels it forwards. Um, these. Uh, coral and kale use um, the increased surface area as a way to increase um, their exposure to nutrients. Um, and I just put the kale lily in there because it's my favorite flower. Um, so we can look at this again from a slightly more um, rigorous mathematical point of view. So um, these are I guess, a bunch of platonic solids. And these are all of the platonic solids that you get made exclusively from triangles. So we've got a um, tetrahedron, which is this one, an octahedron, and an icosahedron. So the, um, the tetrahedron has three triangles that meet at every vertex. The octahedron has four, and the icosahedron has five. So. Um, so we're going to use Schlafly symbols to describe these. So the first number um, tells you the number of sides in your regular polygon. So three is a triangle. Um, and then the second number tells you how many of these meet around every vertex. So three, three is triangles that meet three around every vertex. Okay? And we're going to keep this in mind because we're going to come back to it later. Um, so if we wanted to go to the next number, 3, 6, this is, um, this is I guess, a sculpture we have here. This is um, made by Henry and collaborators. Uh, so this is um, a tiling of the plane. This is the sort of penny packing tiling of the plane. Um, so there are triangles here that meet 6 around every vertex. Um, and we can just continue this on and on. So we can do 3, 7 um, is triangles that meet 7 around every vertex. So this is like taking that fabric I had made before that had one bit of um, seven-fold rotational symmetry and now converting every single hexagon in that fabric to a heptagon, doing exactly the same thing I did before. And that would create this fabric here. Um, and you can keep going. This is 3, 8. Um, and if you kept going, this would no longer fit into the 3D printer. Um, so this is about as far as um, could be done. Um, so if we imagine um, looking at these as uh, tilings of some sort of surface, uh, the platonic solids are tilings of a sphere. So you can imagine kind of taking one and putting a beach ball inside of it and inflating it out. So this would be um, an octahedron that is sort of pushed onto the surface of a sphere. So we've got triangles that meet four around every vertex here. Um, we have um, a plane would be the three six. And then what is this? This is the three seven. Um, and this is something we're going to call the hyperbolic plane. Um, and there are a lot of different models that people use to um, to describe the hyperbolic plane. So this one here is the Poincaré disk model. This is probably the most common of the models that you'll see. Um, and so the idea with this is that um, uh, geodesics, so straight lines, are arcs of circles that intersect the boundary, which here is infinity, at right angles. Um, and this is a conformal map. so. Uh, Circles stay circles, and angles are preserved throughout. Um, but you'll notice that um, this motif in the center, this is sort of close to a regular heptagon. As you move out, you get uh, shapes that are more and more um, sort of squished. Um, and this is something that we're all familiar with, looking at things like uh, the Mercator projection of a map, is any time you go from uh, a curved surface onto a flat plane, you need to have some sort of distortion. So you can imagine having distortions that are based on size. Uh, which is what we're seeing here. You can have angular distortions. You can have all sorts of distortions, but you can't have um, a, a map that preserves area and angle when you um, make uh, this projection. 
So uh, this is the Poincaré disk model, as I mentioned before. There's several other models that um, are quite useful, people like, so this is the Klein model. This is nice because geodesics are actually Euclidean straight lines in this map, um, but you'll notice out here um, these circles are supposed to be circles and they've gotten squashed, so this isn't conformal. So um, this, is, this is a way we're trading off here. So we've got nice straight lines, but now we don't have circles that stay circles. Um, so we're always going to play some sort of game when we want to look at um, hyperbolic space as a map onto a 2D plane. Um, there's also the upper half plane model. This is a pretty nice model, again, because you have um, circles that intersect the boundary um, at right angles, and these are your geodesics. So this is a model that's particularly easy to construct using a roller and compass. Um, and it turns out that these are all related to one another. So this is a sculpture by um, Henry Segerman and Saul Schleimer. And the idea here is that you're using um, light as a way of projecting um, from, uh, from this hemisphere model onto some surface. So when it is at the North Pole of this, you get the Poincaré disk model. When it's infinitely far overhead, you get the Klein model. And when you put it at the equator, you get the hemisphere model. So these are all related to one another. Um, but there's something that's a, a little bit, oops. Uh, so, oh, sorry, this is um, something that you guys are probably familiar with. So Escher um, wanted a way of seeing infinity, um, and he did this using, um, after discourse with um, Coxeter, uh, basically decided to use the hyperbolic plane as a way of visualizing infinity. Um, and he did this uh, using the Poincaré disk model. This is um, circle limit four, or angels and demons. Um, so the idea is you've got uh, three angels that are intermeshed with three demons. And their wingtips here, the six wingtips, um, are all live on a circle. And this is true for every set of uh, three angels and three demons um, in, this, in this motif. So you're supposed to imagine that as you go out further and further, like this little demon here, who's, uh, I guess, his left wing is like twice the size of his right wing, you're supposed to imagine that he's the same size and shape as this demon in the middle here. Um, and so that's pretty hard for, for your brain to see, um, to be honest. Um, so we're going to uh, take a look at this. I'm going to sort of fade out the angels and demons. Um, if my clicker works. Oh, I think we're out of. Oh, yeah. And um, I'm going to leave behind just the circles that the wingtips trace out. Um, so you can kind of see that these are hexagons, and hexagons that meet one another um, at points uh, in four. Uh, at every vertex. Uh, so this is basically going to be the model of the first um, of the first bit, uh, the first the simulation we are going to walk through. Um, but I'm going to draw the dual of this. So instead of um, hexagons that meet four around every vertex, we're going to do squares that meet six around every vertex. So this is um, this is sort of a top-down view of. The, this is like a floor plan, per se, you could say, of the uh, first simulation we're going to walk through. Um, so all of, these, the, all of these models are kind of views from, from the outside of hyperbolic space. Um, they're sort of ways that we've taken it and um, put it into R3 so that we, as natural flatlanders, can see this. Um, but what we'd really like to do is see what it would be like to, to, to actually live inside hyperbolic space. Um, and the, the basic idea that we're going to use is that um, in general relativity, uh, in our real world, uh, photons follow along geodesics. And so that's the mantra we're going to be using to visualize everything here. So we'd like every light ray to follow 
a geodesic in this curved space. And that's how we're going to visualize everything. So there are four elements we need to draw All right, can you guys hear me now? Okay, fantastic. Okay, so there's four things we need um, in order to draw a visual world. We need a model of the space, so ways to associate um, points in that space with a number in my computer. Um, we need a way to uh, draw those points on the screen, and this is going to be following the idea that light rays follow geodesics. Uh, we need a way to move around in that space. Um, and so the reason we have this super fancy VR headset is because it's actually tracking your position as you walk around. So we actually are able to, to move around um, via isometries in that space. And we also need um, a set of landmarks so that you can navigate through the space. Like I could put you in there and have it be completely black and say, oh, well, I coded it up so that everything is um, hyperbolic in there. And you just look at me and be like, yes, so? Um, so uh, we're going to use um, a tiling of the space to, uh, to uh, give you some points to navigate by. So this first one we call H2 cross E, so it's the hyperbolic plane that's been extruded into the Z direction. Um, and so basically, if we wanna see along geodesics, uh, you can imagine having your viewer at the origin here, um, and they want to look out into that space. They follow um, a geodesic until it hits some object, um, and then you render that object on the screen. You don't need to go back and render everything else because it's being blocked by something in your path. Um, so, okay, so this is the first demo. So I'm gonna borrow you, Henry, if that's okay. Um, so I'm gonna switch. All right, can everybody hear me now? Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to, actually, there's a twisty thing on the back. I can't see anything anyways. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of put you where I'd like you to stand. <laughs> Are you sure this hyperbolic space in here because it's completely dark? Uh, you just have to take my word for it. So, okay, so I'm going to reset his view so that um, this will put his head in the center of um, one of these tiles. So these tiles are all cubes, um, and they're cubes that meet six around every horizontal, uh, sorry, every vertical edge and four around every horizontal edge. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna have um, Henry do is walk around um, the vertical edge um, that is right here. Um, and he's gonna have to walk around through six different rooms to get back to where he started. Okay, so he's in kind of a dark green room and he's looking at a red room, so he's gonna walk into the red room. I will tell you when to stop. Um, another step and stop. Okay, then turn 90 degrees to your left. Okay, and walk forward, and I'm gonna move these cords out of your way. <laughs> okay, this would work if I was a bit taller. Keep walking a little bit more and stop. Okay, so now he's in um, sort of up 
pinkish salmon colored room. He turns 90 degrees to the left again. He's going to walk into uh, this sort of uh, multicolored and stop uh, sort of ice cream colored room and turn 90 degrees to the left again. Uh, walk forward into this, sam oh, you, I guess, the polynomy. Um, turn a little bit more. Like that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, a little bit more. Okay, there you go. So walk into the pale green room. Um, and so, okay, stop, turn 90 degrees to your uh, left. Okay. Keep going. Going. Keep going. There you go. Perfect. Um, and so now he's stop. Can I describe it? <laughs> you know, you know the drill. They don't. <laughs> um, so okay. So now he's. Uh, you went too fast. You're supposed to I'm have sorry. been. I needed to tell them where you were back where you started. No. Um, okay. So now he's. Well, I guess. I guess you should have been back where you started now. Yes. Yes. He should be turning by 90 degrees, really, each time. However, he kept walking, <laughs> and so he... <laughs> this is really a right-angled hexagon. This is a right-angled hexagon. He walked too far, so now he has to turn more than 90 degrees. Um, so that's why that's throwing off this demo. If he could actually see what was going on, he would have stopped and not walked too far. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so now you're, you're pretty much square on. Turn a tiny bit more. Okay, perfect, now you're square on. Okay, so this should have been where he started had he not walked a little bit too far. Okay, so now walk straight forward into the blue room. Um, sorry, this is, one past where he should have been when he started. Okay, uh, take, you, you're veering towards this way. You need to. <laughs> 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 okay. okay, now you've totally lost, uh, <laughs> the headset has lost uh, contact oh, wow. with the world. Um, Do you want to go to the next demo? <laughs> well, the animation. Just, uh, okay, just mime it for one sec. So he's going to turn 90 degrees. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> <laughs> 90 degrees, and then just walk <laughs> into the next room. Okay, okay, so basically the idea is that he should have started facing you guys here. He should have made six right-angled turns in R3, and when he's done making all of these turns, looking back where he started, he should be facing this direction, uh, facing away from me. Yes, question. He can. It looks pretty much like Euclidean space going up and down. Um, so this is showing you that um, distances do fall off uh, the way that they should um, because it is Euclidean vertically. It's hyperbolic in the x and y direction. Um, OK, so I do actually have a video to show you what he should have <laughs> done and seen. You can take this off. Um, I'm going to skip the uh, perspective one. <laughs> Thank you, Henry. <laughs> OK. Um, OK, so what he was supposed to have seen, so this is a top-down view of what Henry would look like um, if he were a little um, 